morning, everybody. Happy Monday. Happy Monday, everybody. I am here and I hope you can hear me and I'm all plugged in. Um, let me see, get this all positioned a bit better. Good morning, Anita. It's 68 in Ontario. That is great. It has been beautiful here too in New England. It's been so nice and warm. I hope everybody has the same story. 73, Linda in New Jersey. Good morning, Donna from sunny Alberta. Good morning, Doreen and Crystal in Halifax. Oh, mom, you're there. I thought you were going to be out doing your coffee thing. All right. I know it's lovely there because you're only an hour away. Good morning, April. I think my mom's going to particularly like this episode today. Good morning, April. Linda B. Oh, good. Sitting outside cutting up wool. Isn't that great when you can be outside cutting it up and you don't kick up all the lint and everything on the inside? It's so nice. These stolen days, the Indian summer days. Um, I wonder if you're even allowed to say that anymore, but they are like it, Indian summer is an expression that just gives, just fills you with happiness and makes you feel warm because you know what's to come. And hopefully it'll be a nice bright winter for us, but let's milk these amazingly warm days. What a gift. Good morning, Joelle. There you are. Beverly, good morning. 38 and a bit windy on the coast. Okay. In Washington. So it's a little bit different out there, not having exactly the Indian summer at this moment, but hopefully the wind blows over and maybe you'll get some sun too. Linda H. in Massachusetts. Beautiful. Olivia, there you are. We haven't seen you for a while. Uh, it's dark and wet in Ireland. Well, you know what? It'll be green and emerald soon, right? All the uh, fairies and, and little characters will be singing and everything will be beautiful sooner rather than later, I'm sure. Good morning, Chrissy and Teresa, um, Jess and, okay, Linda B., Denise. All right. Good morning, Tad. Good morning, Amber and Pat. Um, good morning, MJC. Marie. I'm pretty sure that's you, Marie. Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Monday after a beautiful weekend for hopefully most of us. Um, yeah, I, I have to admit, I had to take off a little bit this weekend and enjoy the Indian summer weather because um, you just don't know. It's a gift that you don't know if it's a gift that keeps on giving or if we're going to get slammed with another uh, wintry, frozen, frigid dispel. But it was a great weekend. It was real sunny. The kids were out a lot, wreaking havoc, playing in the hammock. Um, raking leaves and jumping into them. Unfortunately, the dog is out there too. So I think the dog um, probably pooped in the pile because then they needed showers. It's just the mayhem of children and yards and kids and leaves, but it is traditional good old fun, isn't it? You can't begrudge them that. Um, so it was a good weekend. I just want to show you a few things before I get started on a new topic today. I've been looking, I got a magazine that I'll show you that really got me going again, something completely different, thinking about and brainstorming and hunting down um, artists who have hooked, like artists, you know, in the earlier 20th century, late uh, 19th century, who also hooked that will overlap sort of the golden age of rug hooking, at least in the 20th century. So we're gonna talk about that in just a minute, but I first wanna show you before I forget, because I keep forgetting, and I lost my little templates. Where did I put my little templates? I wanted to show, oh, there they are. I wanted to show you a few things. I keep saying my mom has been doing these beautiful designs I'm gonna be posting. This isn't the best way to show this because it's on my fiba tape. Good morning, Julie. It's on my fiba tape, so I was just tracing it two minutes ago upstairs. But what this is, since the cats are out, uh, cats, since the cats are outside, since the kids are outside with the cat, hopefully, um, what it is, is a placemat. Um, because I have this awful, sad, hollow feeling that this might be one of the last years that we talk about S-A-N-T-A in this house, not S-A-T-A-N, but S-A-N-T-A in this house. I think they're outside, but I'm still not going to say it. So, you know, it's a traditional thing here to leave out, you know, the cookies and the milk for S-A-N-T-A and um, the carrots for the reindeer and all that stuff. So um, my mom did this beautiful placemat design. I'll probably put like a poinsettia pattern in the back with a tray full of cookies and carrots for the characters on the roof and a little thing of, um, good morning, Carol. I can see your comment. You beat it. You beat the internet, Carol. I can't believe it all this time fighting with like uh, Big Brother on the internet. And finally you made a comment, great job, um, in the little mug of hot cocoa or whatever with marshmallows floating in it. So I'm gonna start tracing this onto linen and monk's cloth. It'll be available later today on the ribbon candy hooking site. I'm gonna say my name's Deanna David, I always forget to say that. So I did, um, I did an, uh, a market this weekend. I went to the elephant's trunk early, 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 like 
uh, six o'clock on um, Sunday yesterday. And everything was super careful. It's been closed pretty much all summer. Um, but, you know, they've got you going right ways down the aisles and everybody was good with the masks. And they were even on the intercom calling people out whose masks were down over their nose. Um, so it was really, really very, very careful, but a lot. Am I pixelated there? Sweet yeah. drawing. Thank you. And OK, we'll see if we, we're shutting down some of the computers that are on here. So hopefully it comes in better. That is a great design, isn't it? Here, too. All right. Hopefully it comes through better because I have a lot to show show today. Um, anyway, I'll keep talking and we'll see. Shut down as much as you can. OK, yeah. uh, we'll see if it gets any better. But I found at the market. How bad is it? The pixelation? Is it real bad? Fuzzy here in Chicago. Chrissy, you too. No, it's not you. I guess it's everybody. It's medium bad, Jennifer says. Huh, I wonder what to do. Not too bad for Julie. Um, love the elephant's trunk. Yeah, it, it's just opened recently, I think. All right, let's see what happens. We're shutting, okay, we're shutting down some extra stuff that's on here, the kids' computers for school and stuff because they're taking a break. So let's see if it gets any better. Will you let me know if it gets any better? Um, Cause I do want to show you some pictures close up. So yeah, not horrible. All right. Let's see how it glows. Let's see how it glows. So one of the things I found at the elephant's trunk was a frame and it got me going because remember how we talked about last week, the idea of doing a book together where um, we would, we would design some original designs, you uh, things that have to do with your local area, maybe an old tavern sign. That's what got us started or something, you know, local to you. It doesn't even have to be historic. It could be just a house that you love or a garden that you walk by or something, but something local to you, an original design that represents you and your immediate area. And I've gotten a bunch of people writing over the weekend. Cardigan is checkered. Oh, how weird is that? That probably looks cool, but it doesn't help us with details, does it? So spelled your name. Oh no, don't worry about it. No problem. My name is so wacky. Uh, it's misspelled originally on my birth certificate, by birth certificate. Now my speech is pixelated uh, because I was born abroad. Apparently in the Netherlands, um, I couldn't be Diana with two N's because Queen Juliana had one N and apparently it was good enough for her and it would have to be good enough for me. At least that's what my dad and mom were told when they were getting my birth certificate in order. So my, don't worry about misspelling my name. It's tough. It's a toughie. But I found this frame at the flea market that I thought was like extraordinary. Um, you know, it has this fan on it for like the rising sun. And it reminded me of the 1770s, Benjamin Franklin, the writing of the constitution, that era, because this is one of the symbols of that era, not just of Queen Anne furniture, but of that era, same era. But it got me going because I thought if I make a nice piece, rug piece for the, with the book in mind and put it in here, I'm going to do something historic for sure. But a lot of people wrote over the weekend and said, they had ideas and count them in. And I just want to let you know, great, you are all counted in. Anybody who wants to work on this project is going to be in this book that I'm going to be putting together. So don't worry about that. Let me know if you are working on it or if I can help. Um, and let me know if the pixelation is any better. So that got me going with some ideas, historic things that have happened in Connecticut. So I'm working on that. Some of you are working on that. I also found this a bit of a heartbreaking thing. You always get tricked at flea markets. Isn't it true? It's so awful. Sometimes I think it's by accident. Sometimes I'm sure it's on purpose. But, um, you know, when we were talking about the Garrett patterns, the blue nose patterns, all of last week, um, I ended up ordering the Confederation rug pattern. Um, somebody had it in Canada, and I'm obviously not going to hook it onto old burlap. I am going to, thank you so much, I am going to frame it. So I'm going to keep it really safe and I'll do that with a framer so it's perfectly protected because it was the oldest Garrett pattern. But it got me looking on eBay, Etsy, Ruby Lane, different places online that have patterns and searching for specific words like stamped, colored, hand colored, that kind of thing, because many of the blue nose patterns are hand colored. And it makes them so exquisite because even though to hook them, you need to make a copy from them, then save your heritage original. Um, you you know, you like it when that original is beautiful and vivid, which um, the Confederation one is. But I saw this sitting on a blanket in a plastic bag at the flea market. It's not a blue nose, um, but it's beautifully stamped. And it was $5. And I thought, oh, boy, 
Um, can you make a post of what you might be looking for in regard to size? Sure, I'll definitely do that. Um, the question is, can I make a post about what I'm looking for regarding size for each of our projects to put into a book? So I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i say it now and then I'll make a post. You do whatever you want. Um, I will make it work. I'm going to work around you when I'm formatting this thing and, and getting it all together page by page, putting things in order. Um, I'm, I'm going to query Schiffer with it because I already have a great relationship with Schiffer, the publisher, and they have already sent me Amy Oxford's book, which is not really out yet. But I, as soon as I get that in the mail, that next day, no matter what's scheduled, I will review that right here on this channel. That'll be Amy Oxford's new book that's coming out with uh, Schiffer. But I'm going to query them. So if you have a wonderful idea for some kind of a long transom or yard long, or you have like a fan window welcome shape thing going, or a circle or an oval, don't just go with what you feel and, and I will make it work on my end. Do any size you want, but it doesn't have to be giant. Um, almost everything I hook is small because it's just for the website to show what it looks like color wise. So if you want yours giant for posterity, for display, that's okay. And also if you want yours very small, that's okay. Or if you want like a set of two things or four things that go together, that's okay too. So I'm going to make, I'm going to make the format, um, work with what you give me and end up uh, finishing and sending. So we'll figure all that out, but I'll make a post about it. It's, it's anything goes. Um, and I really appreciate it. And it's going to be a really fun project. So cannot wait to see Amy's book. I know me too. I was really excited that they already got that going. So here it is beautiful stamped pattern. And I mean, I was just dying. I didn't take it out till I got back into the car. Um, but then when I opened it, I could see, and I'm going to be real careful here because I still love it. It's got a giant, giant, giant problem. You see this? So I'm going to take it easy here. It's got several problems. I'll see what I can do. You know, if it were like a real special pattern, um, like the three bears or something like that, I'd be doing um, some serious thinking about saving the piece. I I'm going to see if I can frame that in a poster frame or something, but it's just a bummer when that happens. It just goes to show burlap is indeed fragile and over time it doesn't it doesn't want to last how am i doing with pixelation before i move to little stuff am i am i looking any better is my sweater looking any more solid am i looking any more solid <laughs> um same oh boy all right what do you think i'm um, still here what do you think should we um do you think we should abort mission it's getting better for beverly same. I'm just wondering what the playback is going to look like on the channel for the, you know, there's like maybe 50 of us who watch now. Thanks, Liz. Um, you think I should hold Marie? It's a bit better for Olivia. You know, I'll do like a, maybe I'll do a like a teaser of what's to come. It's not that bad, Susan says. All right. Okay. Let's, you know what, if it's absolutely awful, because I am worried about people watching it later, there'll be a few hundred people that watch it later. So, okay, let's keep going. Uh, we will continue the theme tomorrow and I'm gonna do my best. I'll speak slow. I'll hold things up a little bit longer and I can do a lot of picture posts along with this. I will be putting a lot of links into this post later. They're not there yet. I've been running, but there'll be a lot of links later because this is a real inspiration episode. And it might be that you want to follow up with books and things, um, not the quality I'd want. All right. You know, we can always rehash a little bit tomorrow. Um, I'll just I'll just start and let's see how it goes. Um, I'm a bit worried about quality. So what happened um, was I ordered a couple of weeks ago this particular issue of Antiques Magazine. January, February, 2011. So, you know what, I'm gonna take my sweater off. Um, not that I think that's it. This is how much I know about technology that maybe with the sweater off and the old lady shirt prominently displayed, um, maybe this is worse actually. But I bought this episode of, uh, I bought this issue of Antiques, January, February, 2011, because I knew it had something on hooked rugs in it. Sometimes eBay, eBay sellers um, have the time or take the time, oh good, to, uh, maybe it's like a cursed sweater, you know, there's a tavern sign for you, the cursed sweater, the cursed jumper, Olivia, right? <laughs> Still the same. Oh, let's see how we do. So um, anyway, sometimes eBay sellers 
take the time and not everybody has the time to write what the contents are when they list something as small as a magazine that's not going to cost very much. So one seller did. And that's what led me to knowing that this issue of antiques had a feature on hooked rugs. Now it's more than a feature. This is a life changing um, article. And this got me going in many directions, but I'm going to start with the article because, and I'm going to do a little bit of it. I probably won't go full blow because um, so many people are not seeing it. I think I might do, um, I'm looking for my little sheet too. I think I might do just a little bit and then stop. I'll give you a preview. But the article is about an artist um, called Marguerite Zorick. And she is quite a famous artist. Um, the years of her life, just to frame her for you, are 1887 to 1968. So uh, we're not talking super modern. We're talking about like the um, modernist cubist era for painting. And she is going to be a crossover person for that period. So this article talks about her life a little bit um, and the life of her husband, who I think just by the fact that she was a woman, he was much more famous um, during their lives um, than her, right? He got a lot more attention. He got a lot more shows. He got a lot more of the limelight. Lovely person um, he was. It didn't make any difference. It was uh, as soon as she had kids, that was it for her. And she was a mother. YouTube is metering their bandwidth sometimes during the pandemic. You can try checking the quality setting. I just checked mine. Yeah, I'm worried. You know what? I might put the brakes on this. I'm just worried that some of you are okay for quality, but others are not. And it's making me a bit nervous because I would hate to keep holding up um, pictures of things when the when it's not clear enough to really enjoy. So let me change tax for a minute. I'll just tell. I'm going to show a couple more things, but um, I just want to tell you that this, the next episode, and probably at least one more after it, will be about women um, from the sort of late Victorian period, early 20th century, who were. Um, fine artists, sculptresses, printmakers, painters who also crossed over into rug hooking. And many of these names will be names that you maybe haven't heard yet and that you will be so glad that you have heard because their work is exquisite uh, and their hooked rugs are exquisite. So a few of them are in this Antiques Magazine issue. Um, there are a lot from other sources that I started sort of tracking um, and I had a lot more to show you from at least two other artists who were crossover artists as well. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do that part of it tomorrow because with those small things that I'm showing, um, I'm afraid they're gonna be so pixelated you can't enjoy them. So I'll just end with a couple of small pieces of business besides the book business. I wanted to show you, um, what's he called? What did I call him? Primitive Tom. Uh, I finished him this morning and he is uh, ready to go. I've got a lot of yarn. Lacey at the Maritime family sent the yarn to me so quickly because I was out, suddenly out and didn't realize it. She sent it like the same day and it came over the weekend. So Elaine, I'm gonna be dyeing your sampler that you bought. Um, I sent half of your order to you. I'm gonna do that today. Um, and I'm gonna be able to put out these orders today. There's like eight that are on pre-order that are ready to go. I've got the yarn. I'm going to do some dyeing tonight if I run out. But what I like about this pattern for myself and for you, if you want to go the same direction, is just like uh, Native American art, it's very colorful and patchy. Uh, it doesn't have, it's, it's graphic and patchy. So think about that. Rarely do you get something that's graphic and patchy at the same time. Usually it's very sort of formulaic uh, graphic art posters, things like that. But native art, uh, if you think about also sort of tribal art, historical art, like cave paintings, the backgrounds are always very sort of patchy, skewered. The color is not consistent. So with this kit and with the amount of yarn you'll get, which is extra, uh, these will be your colors. There's quite a few. There's, I think, eight, no, eight or nine colors. I think it's nine, um, including the white. You'll be able to decide what you want to do with the background what you want to do with the border. If you want to do what I did and break up the border in many places, if you want to move from color to color in like bands or ledges, um, it'll be up to you. I will put suggestive lines in so you can decide. But in terms of what you do with background, border, dots, uh, these are meant to represent um, 
I guess, little hillsides more than rainbows, I think. This is like a motif I took from Native American art. And the little trees, you'll have to decide for yourself the placement of the color. I'll include a color picture of what I've done, but it'll be even better if you do what feels right as you go. My only tip with this would be, oh, good, Doreen, uh, is be careful with the turkey's background. You want it to be a bit uh, dark behind him and you want his face, yeah, I have his body split, but you want his face in order to make it really readable um, to be pretty consistent. I wouldn't do too much patchy changing behind the turkey because he, he has the potential with this many lines to become confusing. So be careful with that. I wanna show you something else I got from the uh, flea market. You know how with the um, Garrett's, we were talking about how father and son, Frank and John, had a different printing process and how curious that was and how the fact that they printed differently and they patented two different ways of producing commercial patterns that over the years kicked up this false idea that they had had a feud, that they were working independently, separately, differently. And they apparently, it doesn't seem there's no proof that they had ever had a feud. They just preferred to work in different ways. And so I think it was, um, I think it was John. Yeah, I think it was John. I think Frank did the projection that we found out in the end with a sort of uh, little mini lantern, the kerosene lantern. Um, so I think that John did the, the stamping. So he was stamping the way that pattern was that I just held up for you with the, with the holes in it. Um, you can do part of it in stencil, but you're going to have to stamp or hand color the rest of it. So that was more his process. It's patented. I still don't know the exact ins and outs because of course it's patented. So it was supposed to be something of a secret. But while I was at the flea market, I found um, an interesting stall that had tons and tons of metal plates that were used for stamping and advertising. And uh, most of them were like um, logos of, for example, Princess Cruises, uh, Stop and Shop Grocery Store. They were used for, I'm not, he said soap making, but I'm not sure about that because these are quite big. His, his understanding that was that it was soap making, but this man had made tons and tons of these stencils. There were hundreds. Uh, so I was having trouble. Uh, hey, Becky. Oh, there you are, Becky. You know, it's a different day for us because at least half of us are having problems with pixelation. And because of that, I'm winging it a little bit and probably not going to get to the full half hour. And I'm holding on the real meat of today, which is a sort of um, another hat tip to history talking about um, women artists who are fine artists who crossed over into rug hooking. So I think we're going to pick up that tomorrow. And I'm just being a bit silly right now. So not a typical episode. But I went through, you know, it, was, it felt like it was about 120 degrees in the sun and I shouldn't be complaining. But I went through some of the patterns and I took these two, this one for fall and this one for uh, Christmas or the holidays. So Oh, that's nice. Everyone's going to say hi. Um, and the reason I took it was because it made me think of those Garrett patterns uh, and the idea of using stamping as a way of transferring the pattern. So what I'm going to do with this is create a repeat pattern. And I'm going to make a video about it for the channel. And I'll show it, of course, um, probably in stages on our show on Coffee Time. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to get one of those sort of printmaking um, lino block type rollers and figure out what kind of ink is gonna be the best because I'm gonna be transferring it probably onto linen. And I'm going to attempt to print either nine or 16 of these little trees. Um, you know, I'll create a grid on the backing first, but I'm gonna to attempt to do, to create a pattern using the stamping process rather than other transfer processes, tracing lines. Um, I'm gonna to attempt to make a pattern stamping the way that John Garrett did. Um, and see how that goes, because I figure if this can work out, this could be a lovely, simple pattern in either three or 16. You could do very Warhol style, different color background, different color tree. And then it will be up to each. Thanks, April. Uh, thanks, Teresa. It'll be up to each person to decide, am I going to go Warhol and do, you know, real primary colors? Am I going to go uh, all bling and use fancy fibers you know, the crazy eyelash yarns and stuff? Am I gonna put metallic yarns in there to pop the trees? You know, you can go as graphic or as kind of layered uh, blingy as you want with such a simple pattern. And I don't know how it's gonna work out because I don't know the details to the patent uh, that the Garrett's had regarding this method, but there's no reason to not try it. The main thing is trying to figure out 
what the right ink is to roll. Because of course, I normally with those rollers, I do stuff with paint. And I'm not going to put paint on backing because with heat, that could potentially reactivate. Um, what would you stamp with? Um, I'm going to actually stamp with this. So if you were doing something similar, wait and see, because I'll do this this week. Wait and see if it works. But if you like this idea, and if this idea works, particularly if the idea of doing a repeat pattern is exciting or could become exciting, or you know what, you don't even have to do a repeat pattern, right? You could have uh, rectangles this size and in each one do something different. No paint like with art, when I do like fine art and sold fine art different. So I'm not doing that, I'm definitely using ink. But if you were to do a rectangle or a square and you had, for example, uh, nine compartments, you could do a tree in one or two, an ornament in one, a squirrel in one, a snowflake in another, you could actually, you don't have to do a repeat pattern. I'm going to do a repeat pattern to see if it works. Um, at moments, Liz, I am adventurous at rare moments these days <laughs> when I can be, when I can drum up the energy. But let's see how it goes. I'm so curious to see if this will work. So if this does work and this inspires you, what you could do is the same process. Now, with something like a stamp template like this, you know, with kids, maybe in the past, you've done stuff with potatoes, like carving potatoes. Um, even with velvet, it's possible to burn velvet, um, in other words, emboss it with potato stamps. You don't want to do that on your rug backing, on any rug backing, um, because remember, moths will come if you are wool or if your piece is dirty. They typically don't want clean stuff. They're not interested in your pieces that are clean. But if there has been food near your wool or your backing, it's going to be a problem. So we're going to eliminate potato and we're going to go with something like the craft store all sell linoleum blocks and many places online sell wood blocks. And all you need is one wool, wood carving chisel. To get started, all you need is one. So if you like plenty of rubber stamps in the craft store too, that's a great point. So there's large rubber stamps that are, we're not talking about the little fine ones that look like etchings, you know, of like the Thomas Nash, Nash Santa, but there are really large graphic stamps at the craft store and also online on eBay and Amazon that are very graphic, kind of like wallpaper prints. And some of them are festive with holly. And I have some of those and they're beautiful too. So you could do that, particularly with the rubber stamps. If you are a puncher, you know, it, particularly a Russian punching person, uh, and you don't mind the smaller scale, those will work great. But you could, in theory, if we follow through with this, which I will, and this works, and I figure out what kind of ink to use that works the best to roll on, right? You have to roll it on real flat or you get globs and it's not going to work at all. It has to be a minimum amount of ink. If there's too much ink, when you stamp it, it's going to be a pig's breakfast. One giant blob, like that movie, The Blob, from the, right, the 50s, 60s, one of those just spreading across your piece and making uh, you get stomach cramps and um, heartache. So you've used, okay, Beverly says, I have used um, Stazen ink with my rubber stamps on fabric and tiles. S-T-A-Z-O-N. Interesting. Also quilting stencils, Jess said. That is brilliant. Quilting stencils often come on that heavyweight plastic or even lightweight plastic. And you could ink through there with a ripped up little piece of sponge, or they sell daubers at the craft store that are like a little stick with a little dauber, you could create your stencil design out of quilting patterns, great idea, and daub through with ink. So Beverly's saying that she has done similar things with this ink, Stazen, S-T-A-Z-O-N. Um, so that's a great lead. You know what, I'm gonna start with researching that and seeing if that's gonna work for linen or mon monk's cloth. Just picturing the nature of linen, it is um, loose, right? It can be, I have hairless linen from Michelle Micarelli, but it's still um, loose and dry. Uh, monk's cloth, I'm guessing with this stamping process, probably is going to handle it better. Um, it's it's a tighter weave in general, uh, but we'll see how it goes. Not sort of as porous, if you see what I mean. We'll have to see how it goes. SETA, S-E-T-A color paint is thin, so probably won't plug the holes and it's meant for fabric. That's another great tip. I'm going to try to bust out my little roller thing. It's like a little rubber roller that you specifically use for printmaking with lino prints, right? So like linoleum or wood prints. So like a uh, rubber stamp block, but without the rubber part that you carve right into with a chisel. And indeed the fab, the Joann's or Michael sell kits with a block and the cutter thing. So you could cut your own um, design and then do a repeat of it. 
you know, on your backing and see how that goes. What a gorgeous project that would be for the holidays. I'm going to do the tree. Um, and again, I'll get going on that right away. So you can see if you want to do something, imagine a poinsettia or something like that, you know, something that would be absolutely beautiful as a repeat, because remember from our composition classes, repeats in folk art are a home run every time they can't fail. But that's really interesting. You can use the roller brayer. That's the right word, the brayer with most paints. Um, let's look into this. I, I, I agree. And I, I've done a lot of not, I've done a lot of art uh, mediums, like the women that I'm hoping to talk about tomorrow, tried a lot of mediums other than rug hooking and before rug hooking. So I'm going to follow up on this, but you know what? I think that these little picking up these little guys for 50 cents each at the flea market just gave us all a ton of ideas. So this is something else to think about. Think about whether you want to participate in the book project. If you have some kind of local history thing, some local history building, something about you or your family, it doesn't have to be about other people or something, you know, back in time. It can be about something immediate. And now if you have questions on printing, just let me know. Okay. So Jess is saying she was a screen printer for about 20 years. Jess, I'm going to send you an email as soon as we're done here. Um, and let me know what you think. Cause I'll order something from Amazon that will come tomorrow and I can start working on this idea. But yeah, think about this as an idea for us, something that we might do together. Um, and think about whether you want to participate in the book thing, because I've got a good sort of lead going with Schiffer there. I'm going to get a formal query out. And um, yeah, let's get some projects going. It's about to be, I shouldn't even say it, but it is about to be W-I-N-T-E-R. And um, we're going to need a lot of projects to keep us busy and to keep our spirits up. Because floating through the holidays, this landslide to the new year is the happy time. Um, but think about how it sometimes feels uh, to be in January and February. It's good to have a little, little bit of a project going to keep you happy. It is fun. Brainstorming is great. So this episode was not at all what I wanted it to be. I hope I can come back to you um, unpixelated tomorrow because I have this great episode about Marguerite Zorak um, and, and two other women, including Emily Carr, for who Canadians that she's like a Canadian icon, but for... American people, you don't necessarily know her as an artist. She, major trailblazer, artist, um, particularly working with like Aboriginal designs and motifs, the culture, uh, who also transitioned into rug hooking and did a lot with rug hooking. Um, so we're gonna talk about um, those people tomorrow and maybe a couple more people. So cross your fingers, cross your eyes, cross your feet, say a little prayer, whatever works that we'll be back tomorrow with full programming. And um, in the meantime, Jess, I'm going to write to you and we'll do some brainstorming about our newly evolving projects. Have a great day, everybody. It was great to see you, even if I'm all cubist. I'll see you tomorrow.